and then we'll take it from there. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Conrad, director of the University of Arizona Press. Welcome to our event from the Border and Open Book Summer Roundtable. The University of Arizona Press is the premier publisher of academic, regional, and literary works in the state of Arizona. Located 60 miles north of the US-Mexico border, we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Tona Atom in a state that is home to 22 federally recognized tribes. We are committed to publishing the voices and histories of the US-Mexico borderlands and interdisciplinary border scholarship has been a cornerstone of our publishing program since our founding in 1959. In addition to border studies, we publish in anthropology, archeology, span environmental science, history, indigenous studies, Latinx studies, Latin American studies, and the space sciences, as well as award-winning fiction and poetry series, Sun Tracks and Camino del Sol. We publish about 55 books a year, and have more than 1,600 books in print. This round table will reflect on borderland studies and scholarship today. Our event caps a three-year publishing project from the University of, Open, of, of Arizona called Open Arizona. Open Arizona is a collection of open access University of Arizona press books that highlight scholarship, histories, and approaches to understanding the US-Mexico borderlands. The project was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation as part of the National Endowment for the Humanities Open Book Program. Several works in open Arizona include new original essays by leading scholars, some of whom are with us today, offering contemporary reflections on these once out of print works, including some foundational works in border studies. Please welcome our moderator for today's event, Kristen Buckles, Editor-in-Chief at the University of Arizona Press, who will introduce our author panelists. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, thank you, everyone. I will say it is a gorgeous, rainy summer Tucson day here in Southern Arizona. And it's the perfect weather, the perfect day to grab a cup of coffee and to sit around and have this, this wonderful chat. So thank you all for joining. It's, um, it's a real honor to introduce um, our panelists, our roundtable participants today. Um, it's a real treat for me to be doing this. And um, so in alphabetical order, uh, we have Dr. Maurice Crandall. Uh, Dr. Maurice Crandall is assistant professor of Native American studies at Dartmouth College and a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation of Camp Verde, Arizona. He is the author of these people have always been a republic, indigenous electorates in the US-Mexico borderlands, 1598 to 1912. And this book was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. We also are very happy to welcome Dr. Fon Vanessa Fonseca Chavez. And uh, Dr. Fonseca Chavez is an assistant professor of English and assistant dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at Arizona State University. She is the author of most recently, Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature and Culture, Looking Through the Kaleidoscope, published by the University of Arizona Press in 2020, and the co-editor of this book, Currencia, Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland, published by the University of New Mexico Press, also in 2020. And we have, uh, welcome Dr. Yvette Saavedra. Dr. Saavedra is Assistant Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Oregon. She is the author of Pasadena Before the Roses, Race, Identity, and Land Use in Southern California, 1771 to 1890. And this book was published by the University of Arizona Press in 2018. And welcome, uh, Maurice, Vanessa, and Yvette. Thank you so, so much for your time today. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, I will say again, it's a real treat for me to be sitting here in conversation with you, um, talking about a topic that is uh, really close to us. It's at the core of our editorial program at the University of Arizona Press. Um, 
it is borderlands and borderland studies. And so it's a really, it's what an opportunity for me to be able to sit in this Zoom roundtable to you and have this conversation. And so I'm hoping let's to start it off generally and just talk about that term um, borderlands because you hear the term borderlands a lot and you hear it sort of in different ways depending on, on the discipline um, from like a very land-based place um, here around the US-Mexico border to something more metaphorical, like a more metaphorical in-between space. And here I'm thinking of like Gloria Anzaldúa's work. Um, so I'm wondering if I could ask each of you um, to talk about how, how you think about borderlands as a term and how you use that in your own research and scholarship. Um, so Vanessa, can I, can I call on you to go first? Yes, thank you, Kristen. And thank you to the University of Arizona Press for inviting us to this conversation today. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation and glad that y'all are here to join us. Um, so the first question that was posed to us was just generally speaking, how do we conceive of the term borderlands? And I think um, as someone who comes from a Spanish cultural studies background, I first thought about borderlands as this um, more broadly as not just a geopolitical term, but a term of, um, you know, related to boundaries and the ways uh, gatekeeping and the way that uh, US policies, I, I am a Spanish undergraduate uh, masters and PhD holder. And so I often think about it as linguistic boundaries and sort of what were the policies and procedures in place that um, stripped language from so many of our communities in different ways, right? And I know that later on, we're gonna talk about colonization, but I think about it first in terms of like linguistic um, assimilation and the ways in which um, Latino communities have tried to recuperate their languages and then also to be able to maintain those languages. And a lot of that happens through those cross border contacts, right? So there's often conversations about uh, Spanish language is uh, revitalized through migration processes. And that helps us to preserve the maintenance of Spanish language anyway, within Hispano, Latino, Chicano identified communities. Um, I also think about it in metaphorical ways because I am also a literature scholar. So I think about the creative possibilities of um, reconceptualizing borderlands, um, thinking about works of historical fiction, for example, that imagine different possibilities um, for borderlands. We know it to be um, simultaneously a violent place, but also a, a place of creative capacity um, and culture and community building and sharing. And so I like to think of it really as more um, a space of opportunity to reimagine and to rethink the way we might move into the future, given um, that sort of like geopolitical marking, right? What can we do in response to those those drawn lines? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Vanessa. That was um, that was a great answer. And so I'm wondering if we can um, shift to Maurice now, who works in uh, very very much. You're a historian, and so. Could you talk about borderlands? Sure. Um, I, th I think about, you know, there's an article that was in the, uh, this is the JAH by Sam Truitt and Pekka Heimelainen years ago called On Borderlands. And there, there's a quote in there uh, where they quote Alan Taylor in a conference where he said, you know, borderlands is, is in danger of being used to death, just like um, it's, it's twin, uh, at the time, which was middle ground. And, and I think um, borderlands is one of those terms now that's, that's, that is used um, a lot. And, um, you know, like as historians, sometimes we're the worst at defining our own terms and, and what we're saying. And so, and, and I'm sure I'm guilty of that as well. What do I mean when I'm using a term? And so specifically with borderlands, I mean, it's in the title of my book. And so what, what do I mean when I use that? Um, uh, I think it, it has a number of meanings. One, when I think of borderlands, I think of places of convergence. So like Vanessa said, it can be um, places where there are actual you know, national boundaries uh, between nation states, um, but also metaphorical, ideological. Uh, they are places where maybe, maybe I could say where, um, there, where there are markers for the people living there and 
They can be territorial boundaries like bounded um, indigenous homelands. For example, like a, a, a tribal nation has you know, like four sacred mountains that, that bound its territory. And a borderlands are those areas in which um, there is maybe a shared or also a disputed sense of territoriality where other tribal nations or other nation states or empires you know, lay claim to a similar area. And so there's a convergence that happens there that can be, um, it can be a place of, of negotiation, but it can also be a place of violence and um, you know, the displacement of, of peoples. But I think of borderlands as, as areas where those convergences happen. And again, those can be very physical, but they can also be um, ideological. And for me as well, borders are, you know, if we were to think of like an old kind of Turnerian or, or Boltonian model of borderlands where they're like at the periphery and they're the, the far places, um, I think a lot of what we do as borderland scholars is changing that from the, the borders are the center places for the people who live there, that those are the places of um, the most ex, uh, important experiences um, and developments, whereas you know, like seats of power, uh, far away imperial seats of power are, the, are the, the periphery for people who live and inhabit borders that, that Borderlands are the are the are our center places. I guess that's um, the best way to put it. I mean, as a person who who lived and grew up in in what we would consider borderlands, um, but I think that those are ways that I think about borderlands in my work. Um, and I don't think that it's an easy term to to define because it means so many different things. It's so contextual and it also a uh, historical term that that kind of um, defies periodization and it can. It, it, it's um, sort of a flexible term. Thank you, uh, Maurice. I, I, uh, that's I, I like thinking about that uh, borderlands not as the sort of let's see, borderlands as the core, not the periphery. That's a interesting concept. Yvette, what about you? Um, well, you know, first off, thank you for for having us today. Um, uh, and you know, I think my ideas in thinking about borderlands. It, it's cool to hear hear my colleagues and how what informs their understanding of it. And so trying to place myself into that particular discussion, I realized that I came to the concept of, well, to borderlands from a different way. I think my first exposure to it was through a queer Chicana feminist epistemology. And so then I, you know, granted it was like my senior year of undergrad. And then by the time I got to grad school at UTEP and the Borderlands History Program, it was a, it, it, it allowed my understanding to grow. So my defining of Borderlands is informed by my training as a historian, but also as a queer Chicana, from a queer Chicana feminist epistemology. And so as a result of that, I, I see Borderlands as several things. I see it as a geopolitical space. I, I see it as a process of power. I see it as a metaphor, a methodology, a consciousness. For me, all of these things, they're, they're formed around this malleability, right? For me, they are about malleability, about accommodation and disruption, about transversing human-made boundaries of power, of discipline, and of, exi of different existences. And I think, and, and I know this isn't going to be the, the super clear way that historians, we love to define things, but I think that's the fun part of it, right? is that they are messy and they're complex. And so what I see, you know, taking this big definition I have of borderlands, I see them as all of them reflecting interactions and contestations where people and power collide. And this is what I seek to do in my work. I seek to engage all of these elements simultaneously to show how they inform each other over time and space. And for me, it's a way to find what's written between the lines what's blurred within the larger narratives and how people get to understandings of ways of knowing about themselves and about the place and experiences that they have. And that, that for me is how I see Borderlands. That um, all three of your answers, like I feel like we can just end now on that. That was just <laughs> great answers. I wondered if you had um, any follow-ups or if you wanted to keep this this uh, line of conversation open before we move into the next question. 
I have a, I have a follow up. I, I really liked what Yvette said that our, our understandings of borderlands come from our lived experience largely. Um, you know, my own as like from a young age, having an understanding that like, for example, um, reservations are bordered spaces that indigenous people inhabit, even if they're not at, um, you know, like a US Mexico border or a US Canada border that we, we live in bordered spaces, both territorially and ideologically with like a reservation boundary, for example. And I've, I've told this story of like the town that I lived in, in Arizona, there's like a, a reservation part of the town and then there's the non-reservation part of the town. And we used to skateboard at a school that was off reservation. And um, I didn't do this, but my friends told me like years previous that they had been there. And, and when the police would come to bust them for skateboarding at a place where it was illegal, that they would like run across the street to the reservation because there wasn't a, um, like a, a jurisdiction uh, agreement between reservation police, Yavapai Apache Nation police and local town police. And so it was like a way to escape uh, jurisdiction and like transgress, like, like Yvette said, structures of power, you know, and like a little as like a young skate punk, that was, you know, your way of doing it without realizing that this is like a huge issue of, of indigenous mm -hmm. power, territory, jurisdiction. And now there's, now there's a, uh, like a, a jurisdiction sharing agreement. And so like police from that town can go onto the reservation if they're in pursuit, but at the time yeah, they couldn't. And, um, but I think that it's important to note that like our experiences with borderlands are, and this is something I'm sure we'll come back to in, in the coming discussion, largely informed by our own experiences. You know, Vanessa talking about Spanish language and um, you know, transnational migrations of people and ideas and language revitalization coming from that. I mean, these, these all are things that we know um, firsthand. And I think growing up, we might not have been able to define what that meant in terms of borderlands and bordered lands, like Yvette said, not really getting to that until like senior, you know, seminar or something in, a, in undergrad, but getting to that and realizing, oh my gosh, that's the experience that I've had my whole life. Like I, I recognize all of that, it resonates. That's what borderlands means, that, it, that it's, a, um, it's a theoretical thing, but it's a very personal lived um, thing for all of us, I'm sure. Yeah, and I just wanted to add this sort of, I really like the idea of convergences and, you know, thinking about the, our lived experiences in relation to uh, where we're at and how we study borderlands and grow, growing up in New Mexico is a very, uh, I don't know if it's a unique experience, but it's a, it's an interesting experience when we're thinking about convergences, especially given our current political moment and the long history of, I know we're going to go into colonization in a little while, but I mean, there's a lot happening right now where, you know, um, you know, Pueblo peoples, other tribal nations throughout New Mexico and like Hispanic origin peoples, um, Mexican American origin peoples are experiencing various like complexities and convergences right now where, you know, we're being asked to really think about what kind of relationships we have to one another and what are our responsibilities to one another in healing sort of these past traumas. And, you know, it's, it's a difficult conversation. And I think, you know, people often say like, well, it's just really complex in New Mexico, right? And just sort of leave it at that. But I think also, you know, coming from there and then coming to Arizona and experiencing a different type of borderlands existence, right? For students who, um, who are first generation or second generation, which was less, um, less common in New Mexico when I was teaching there, but also thinking about what does it mean for them to, you know, be in Arizona as first gen students um, compared to, you know, folks in New Mexico who had, you know, fifth, six, seven generation stories from New Mexico and thinking about like, what does that mean also in terms of like the longer history of New Mexico and Arizona as, you know, borderland states and their relationship to one another. So it's just been really interesting kind of like you're, the states are right next to each other, but they have very, you know, complex and differentiated histories in many ways. I'm wondering if we can uh, keep on the lived experience thread for a bit because it's come up naturally in each one of your responses and the question which was originally going to be uh, question four uh, about this lived experience of, uh, of the scholar and so um, what I posed is like all three of you have really close personal deep connections in the U.S. Mexico borderlands 
And um, the two of you have taken academic positions away from the borderlands. And I'm just really curious about uh, how being geographically away has affected how you think about, about the borderlands. And I'm thinking uh, Yvette and Maurice here, or conversely, like how does the lived experience of being here in the borderlands and having family here factor into your, your research decisions? Um, so uh, Yvette, do you, wanna, do you wanna start that one? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in, in hearing my colleagues speak, it, it's um, the, the and, and as you're mentioning, Kristen, Kristen, the idea of lived experiences is super, super important to how I understand the border and borderlands. Um, and so my, I grew up in Huntington Park, which is um, southeastern Los Angeles. Um, and so my experience of living on the border, at the border, was uh, in my time at El, in El Paso, at UTEP. And although my mom, my mom and my, my mom's side of the family is all from El Paso Juarez. Um, so I did visit as a child. And so as I, I experienced the border as an adult. Right. And I think that it was very um, it was it was a pivotal, a pivotal experience for me because I, I got to see um, how power is so integrated into these spaces. And I think that that it's no surprise in that all the work that I do revolves around the questions of power. Um, and so in answering this particular question, um, I'll answer it in two ways and I'll be brief, I promise. Um, <laughs> first, I'll answer it um, from the more like metaphorical personal lived experience of the border. Um, first, as a, as a queer, masculine looking, presenting Chicana, first generation college student, faculty member of color, I carry the borderlands with me every day as I cross multiple boundaries every day, right? And, and while I recognize the light skin privilege that I have and the class privilege that I have being an academic and being in a university setting, I'd, I'm speaking specifically here about the borderlands in, in the, that I carry that deal with my experiences in terms of homophobia and, and not fitting into the heteronormative understandings of, of what you know, identity and gender should be. And so that's one element of my lived experiences with the border. Um, now, being in El Paso physically and, and you know, seeing my cousins and interacting with my cousins and that side of the family and, and seeing how they contextualize their space and their experiences in relationship to, to, to Juarez was, was also very eye-opening for, for me um, in the sense that, you know, I, I, it's like in many ways in, in Huntington Park, I experienced that as, as you know, we're all, we're all Mexicans. Right. Um, in, in El Paso, it was a little bit different. So I, I think I started to see just how much the national identity played a role in the creation of, of, of identity for Chicanos or, or Chicanx peoples in, in the US. Um, now, in terms of physical proximity, yes, this totally freaked me out when I moved to Oregon. Um, I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just a, it's a very different, different experience, right? I, I'm, I'm always thinking, you know, I, I had grown up, I grew up in the Southwest and moving up here was an experience very different from that. Um, so when I moved to Eugene, Oregon, um, I think in, in many ways, what was different for me was just the, the fact that we're living in a community that, that is primarily a white community. And so for me, I, I, had, I had to kind of think about, okay, well, how am I gonna conceptualize borderlands here? And I think that because I approach borderlands from a perspective of power and understanding how power plays out between people and, and in spaces, um, I think that it's, it's a very interesting place to live in order to understand in, in essence that this place is a borderlands. It's not a borderlands in terms of a geopolitical border, but definitely in terms of culture and ethnicity um, and class, um, because I think sometimes that kind of gets subsumed. Um, and so while you know we see things like Oregon's demographics changing, and here I mean Oregon, the university, as well as the state, Right. And as the demographics of the state and the university change, we are seeing new understandings uh, or rather interactions between people. And we see that, you know, premised here at Oregon with the creation of the Latinx studies minor program. Right. And so that in itself is, is borderlands. And so I, I think it still influences my work because I'm looking at, at how power plays out. 
but then my own individual interactions and navigation of this space is it just it conti continues to fuel my desire to understand how and why people interact with each other the way that they do. Hmm. How about you, Maurice? Can can I ask you to answer the, the same question? Yeah, I mean, I, I experienced the same culture shock moving to uh, New Hampshire, Vermont. Uh, it is a world apart from the Southwest. I mean, I lived almost all of my life in New Mexico and Arizona and going from like the heart of what we would consider the, the US-Mexico borderlands to a place like here, it's, it's called the Upper Valley. Um, you know, like the nearest comparison would be the US-Canada border, which is north of us. And um, I think when you when you move away from a place that, that has um, been such a part of you, that is a borderlands in that way, you, you try to find similarities where you're at. Um, and sometimes they're really hard to find, but then sometimes they're not. And, and so I look like not that far away are um, Haudenosaunee peoples, you know, Iroquois Confederacy groups that straddle a border between the United States and Canada and, and think about um, citizenship and nation state in different ways, much like Ton Autumn people in Southern Arizona think about um, nation and border. And so, you know, when I, when I see that and when I travel through those areas, which aren't far away, you know, like there's a certain exhilaration again. So it's, it's kind of like, oh, I'm in a, a borderland kind of like, sort of uh, like the one that I know. Um, but I think that we all, um, when you have that experience of living away from a, 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 an area that's that clearly bordered, um, where it's so visible, that it can it can be sort of shocking, um, and 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 maybe it puts those things into like um, clear relief in a way. Like I think it helped me as a scholar uh, see those boundaries and those experiences a little more clearly and maybe a little more circumspectly. Um, and then and then you you also like carry those things as you go. You know, it's like you those experiences of like trying to find red chili pods in Vermont, you know, like where in the world do you find them? Um, or um, like when I go back home and, and you know, what are like the first things you do? Or if you go, you know, if, if I'm back in New Mexico or something, it's like the first place I go is Allsup's to get a, a chimney or something like that. You know, like those are the, the, those kind of quotidian borderlands experiences like never leave you. And you, you try to sort of like, refill those in a, in a weird way. Um, uh, but, I, but I do think that being away from Arizona, New Mexico, the place where, and, and you know, Northern Mexico, Sonora, those places where my work is situated, um, helped me see them in a different way and, and give some clarity. I mean, when there's some distance from something, like you see it in a different way. So I think that that's helpful. I think it's a good experience for any, um, individual to go to, to, to go through, to be away from what is totally familiar and then um, see it in, in different ways and then be able to revisit it with, with um, maybe newer insights uh, or different insights. And, and so that's been a good experience, but I, but I miss the Southwest by, you know, all kinds. I miss New Mexico and Arizona, um, a lot and 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 I think that that plays a part of my scholarship. So like, is it is can your scholarship get like can you sentimentalize a place? I think you you probably can. You know, if you're not careful, you can probably do that. Um, so th I think these are all things that I think about being away from it. Um, and it's I think that's a good. I think it, it sort of just forces you to see and think about it in a, in a different way. But then also look for. Um, similarities that the borderlands are everywhere and that there are themes that go across boundaries that that yes the US Mexico border is unique in certain ways but it, but it doesn't hold the the you know it isn't um, it doesn't have exclusive rights to the border experience that that is that's in other places as well and I think it being in those other places helps you to kind of see that maybe a little bit more Vanessa, we're lucky to have you still in Arizona. 
Yes. I'm wondering I, if you could answer. I would imagine that the Phoenix area is very different from your home in New Mexico. So I'm wondering if you could also reflect on this question. Yeah, you know, I found myself laughing a little bit, uh, Maurice, when you said all subs, because we were just in Heber the other day. And I told my husband, I was like, are you guys going to go to all subs later? And he's like, what's all subs? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's Circle K. Because like all subs is a very New Mexico thing. And so and it's where you go to get your chimichangas. And it's like, you know, after a night on the town or whatever. And but West I Texas. Did, and West Texas. There are all okay. subs in West Texas. Yeah. All right. yeah. <laughs> Shout out to West Texas also then. Um, but I did go, uh, my first faculty appointment was at the University of Wyoming. And so I left New Mexico. And again, Maurice, I'm just thinking about this, like once, never in my life had I imagined being at in the state of Wyoming. Um, and I tried to look for those similarities. And I thought, you know, there's this, the elevation is the same as Grants, New Mexico, which is my hometown. There's, you know, this outdoor culture that we're really into hiking, camping, fishing. And so we tried to embrace the very, you know, the similarities that we could attach ourselves to while also being very aware, much like Yvette and Maurice, of the cultural shock that uh, ensued. Um, you know, the various microaggressions, the various, um, you know, just, um, you know, the different sort of scenarios where you find yourself thinking like, okay, this is a different border space, right? And so this is actually where um, I looked for, again, creative opportunities in these borderlands, like I said at the beginning. And um, I actually started a project with uh, Levi Romero, who's at the University of New Mexico called Following the Manito Trail. And so we used uh, my time in Wyoming as an opportunity to explore the migration patterns of Hispanic New Mexicans who had went up to Wyoming in the mid 1800s um, through the present day who migrated for different economic opportunities. And so we're able to conduct a number of oral history interviews with um, you know, folks who migrated up to work as sheep herders um, in the railroads, in the mines, um, in the sugar beet fields. And that ended up being really enriching for um, you know, the creation of community because it was also really nice to interact with other folks who were from New Mexico, but who were living in the state of Wyoming. And about 30% of Wyoming's population, um, Mexican American population rather is, uh, is originally from New Mexico. And so that was really, that was an exciting opportunity. And so um, of course, when I had the opportunity to come back to the Southwest, I jumped on it. And um, you know, we saw the Southwest as being the place where we would, we would wanna hang out for a longer period of time. But sometimes we miss Wyoming, we miss uh, the small community. I think that for me, especially being from a very rural community in New Mexico, um, Wyoming felt like that really cool sort of rural community where you, you know, not everybody likes this, but when you see your neighbors at the store and you see them on campus and you see them at church and, um, but the other really interesting thing about it was also getting to know more about sort of the borders and boundaries aspect of Hispanic communities living in uh, places like Riverton, Wyoming, which is a border town for um, the Wind River Reservation where Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone are and to know about the complex histories of how those two tribes ended up on the same um, on the same territory. And it was a 100 year agreement and that had been extended. And so there's also these really um, interesting questions about um, it is the only um, you know, for federally recognized uh, you know, tribal reservation in the state of Wyoming, but to also really delve deeper into how those histories and stories are being told within the state of Wyoming and knowing that um, in large part, Latino histories, indigenous histories in Wyoming are overshadowed by this larger narrative of the equality state, the wild, wild west, like we really buy into a lot of those narratives. And so um, it, was a very, it was a very interesting and enriching experience to be there. Um, and with that said, I am happy to be back in the Southwest. Um, it's where our families are from, where our families have been from. And um, it's, it's, um, it's nice to be able to interact with the communities that I work with regularly, to be able to say like, I can be in East Arizona in three hours, let's hang out, let's go to bingo, let's talk about you know, the stories from your communities um, and then it'll also be really close to family. So there's a lot of good opportunities with that. Um, but again, really enjoyed our time in Wyoming. And so, and sometimes we're sad that we're not there, especially when it's 115 degrees in Phoenix. Um, I'll just pause. Um, Maurice, Yvette, did you have any follow-ups? Um, you know what, what I thought what, what I, in listening to y'all, um, it reminded me of Anzaldúa's comment or the quote from her that says, I had to leave home so I could find myself. Right. And I think that that just really speaks to, to this idea of, of how impactful this place can be and how formative it is. And 
I don't know for me, like how much I realized that after I had left it. Right. Um, so that's just, I, I, this, this whole conversation is very much Anzaldua for me today. <laughs> I'm in a very Anzalduian space today. <laughs> I think we will go back if I can ask you questions about your research and scholarship now. Um, we, what came up a little bit earlier was um, colonialism, right? Like, um, I think if you're going to talk about the US Mexico borderlands, inevitably um, the colonial history of the US Mexico borderlands is probably going to come up in some way. And um, each of you in your books um, use sort of or look at uh, the colonial history of the US-Mexico borderlands across time um, and the, the changes in the colonial regimes from you know, the Spanish to the Mexican to the US American and really look at sort of the lived experience of the people who sort of experienced these colonial um, regimes across time. And so I'm, wanting, I'm really curious about um, sort of the folks who lived in the borderlands during sort of a time of transition of the colonial regime. So in other words, like, you know, someone who might've been living here under Spanish rule and then under Mexican rule. And what, you know, if there's examples from the archives from your research of like what that um, experience might've lived, been like for like a family or community. Um, Maurice, can I ask you to, to start that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I, all of the groups that I have have worked on and, and um, written about and collaborated with uh, have long histories of, of colonial experiences. I mean, from the Spanish era through the present. And I would also say that, you know, that the colonial period hasn't ended in the Southwest. I mean, it's still the, the, the you know, with the most one of the most colonized places um, that, that you could imagine and um, you know, highly, highly policed. Getting back, that was one of the things that shocked me the most about the Upper Valley living here in Vermont, New Hampshire is like I never saw a police car anywhere. Whereas in New Mexico and Arizona, law enforcement, that police presence is, is everywhere. It's ubiquitous, like it's, it's always there because they're policing brown, black, you know, people of color, they're policing uh, bodies. Uh, but thinking about um, the communities that I, that I was uh, that are in my book, for example, you know, Tana Athens, uh, Pueblo nations, absolutely have have you know, there's a very long history of of um, experiences with colonization, and and you know what I find, like let's take the pueblos for example. Um, you know, from the, the 16th century, from the 1540s through today, um, I would say that the number one uh, um, approach, the number one um, way of confronting colonial powers has been uh, de demanding recognition of uh, indigenous nations as nations, as sovereigns, and meeting imperial or state powers in a way that that um, that reinforces that idea that these are indigenous nations. Uh, so, like you asked for an example, when Spaniards come to New Mexico and and establish a, a colony in the, in the late 1590s. And, you know, there's this ceremony and Pueblo leaders meet with um, Spanish, both state and, and religious officials. And, you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're read and, and told that these are your, your new sovereigns, you know, your two, they're your two lords, the Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and, and the King of Spain are your, are your new sovereigns. And they're, they're made to go through this entire thing um, but they never lose this concept that they are sovereigns, that um, they are meeting these colonial powers as sovereigns themselves. And, and so whatever um, structures are put in place 
the Pueblo peoples recognize those as, as um, reinforcing their sovereignty in many ways. And so when there's like a, a change in sovereign, when it go, goes from in New Mexico, from Spanish New Mexico to Mexico, um, Pueblo peoples you know, still expect that same recognition um, of sovereignty and those same ceremonies that they go through on a yearly basis where Pueblo leaders are recognized by the govern governor in Santa Fe as having you know, sanction to um, govern their communities. Um, and when the United States comes in the in the fifteen in the eighteen forties with the U.S. Mexico War, you know you have military authorities with um, the Army of the West who come into Santa Fe and they meet with Pueblo leaders and they're um, and they comment on the, these interactions and and they say you know it's interesting that these these Pueblo leaders come to us and they have these canes with silver tips, uh, which were the canes that Spanish. Uh, authorities gave to them hundreds of years previously. And they're, they're sort of saying, we are, our sovereignty was recognized and we expect you to recognize it as well. Um, and, and so that is sort of like the overriding theme with indigenous nations. The most important thing is a recognition of sovereignty that no matter the empire or the nation state or the, the, the outside entity that's, that's coming in, indigenous people act in a way um, and make it clear that they demand their sovereignty to be, to be recognized. And, and it's not always recognized and, and it's, it's um, countered on many occasions. Um, but I think that um, over time it, it has been recognized and, and, and you see now that indigenous nations are, are um, recognized as on a government to government basis with the, the federal government. And that's, that's, that's how you see um, indigenous nations in this bordered area of, of New Mexico acting, for example, throughout these various transitions that the, the, the underlying, under, uh, underlying factor is we are indigenous nations, we are sovereign nations, and, and uh, this needs to be recognized. I think, uh, let's stay in uh, New Mexico. Vanessa, if you want to respond or go next. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think, thank you for that, Maurice. I'm trying to, you know, stay in New Mexico and also think about, you know, as my title of my book suggests, um, thinking about how these legacies are played out within different spaces in New Mexico and Arizona throughout the Southwest and the way that we continually carry a colonial mindset in different capacities. And, you know, I often start by telling my students that race is a colonial construct, racism is a colonial construct, power is a colonial construct. And so when we're thinking about what are the origins of the ways that we have been separated from each other, that we have not been allowed to act in community or be in community, like these are all colonial structures. And how do we undo those colonial structures to get back to a place where, um, you know, togetherness and understanding and all of that good stuff matters more than, you know, power or matters more than your race, right? And so these are, um, these are difficult questions as Maurice pointed out within the Southwest because there are, you know, I call it a kaleidoscope of colonial constructs, right? Where power is always at the center. Power and violence have always been at the center of colonial constructs and that's something that we continually grapple with. And so while we can be more attentive to, um, to gender, to race, to the different ways that we intersect, the different intersections that we carry with us every day, it's really, as Yvette said earlier, power that is at the center of, of all of this, right? And so what does it look like to relinquish power? What does it look like to recognize sovereignty for indigenous communities? Uh, we have to do that thinking very selflessly. Um, because I think it's also a matter of people, you know, in New Mexico, it's a question of, you know, folks who inherited Spanish land grants, for example, also need to stop and realize the inheritance of their Spanish land grants came at the cost of indigenous homelands. And that is something that's hard to grapple with. Um, because a lot of Hispanic communities in New Mexico, their families have farmed on that land for generations, or they, I don't come from a land grant family, you know, but looking at sort of those dynamics become complicated, right? And there are multiple moments of convergence over time where like, Pueblo and Hispano people, you know, were in community, right? But there are also these digressions, and we see that in my book anyway, through the conversations about Spanish conquistadores and the way that we honor them through statues and monuments. And these really provide multiple moments of political urgencies and conflict that remind us that there's a lot of historical trauma that needs to be healed. Um, I don't know what that healing looks like. It looks different for communities, right? But we know colonization is a global phenomenon, and it's very and it, it 
it uh it's entwined to different communities in different ways, right? So every community needs to have sort of their own strategy for decolonial struggle. And that decolonial struggle is gonna change dependent on the different sort of political urgencies and the ways in which communities um, ideally want to come together. And so it is a very complex question to just even think about like, what do we do with colonial oppression, right? Abolish it, of course. Um, but the how is much more complicated and dependent upon the specific needs of communities as they work toward becoming, you know, larger communities. Yvette, how about uh, uh, <laughs> colonial powers in Southern California or your, in your research? Um, you know, I, before I get to my answer, Vanessa, something you just said, it, it kind of it, it goes into what I'm what I'm going to talk about about my research, the and I and I think Maurice you also said this right and it, it was a thread in your in your response, like the fact that one group's resistance is is always at the cost of another group's freedom right or their own um, expression of autonomy, um, and I think that that's one of the things that I'm looking at in my work right in my in my book anyways um, in my book I, I examine the ideas of optimal land use and its effects on the formation of identity in Southern California, specifically the area that is now known as Pasadena, California, in Southern California. I trace about 150 years of shifting power dynamics, which sounds daunting, but when you come to think about the fact that I originally wanted this to go up to like the 1930s, like I think I cut it right at the right point um, for the work. Um, but one of the things that called me to this topic was this question of how people use the world around them to define their identities. Because that I think is something that we can historically we can trace that people will use the spaces around them to define who they are, um, and of course we know that with the <laughs> excuse me with the dispossession of of indigenous lands and the colonization of indigenous populations, it the the creation of of colonial identities comes at the expenses of indigenous autonomies, right? And, and, and so in this sense, I think looking at, at, my, at my work, um, the idea, again, the idea of power and the various dynamics of it, the contradictory and complementary ideas of power and how they function were at the root of what I, what I was looking at, right? So essentially I was thinking about how did individual groups during each of these moments or colonial regimes, if we will, um, moments of conquest and colonization, how did they look at the land and create discourses about the land that then allowed them to justify and legitimize what their actions were on the land itself, but towards the people that were there before them, right? And so what we're seeing is like this, like, like, um, you know, essentially, and, and, and of course, it, it's not a matter of, of, of completely displacing and erasing the groups that came before them, but it's a way of controlling the historical narrative and the memory about the place, right? And, and, and so um, I, I look at the example of the Californios here, right? Because I think their position is an interesting one to me in the sense of how they use these spaces to, um, to define themselves. Um, you know, for example, we see them um, challenging the, um, you know, pushing for the secularization of mission lands during the early part of the 19th century. And of course, with that secularization, they're developing their own identities as landowners, right? And their maintenance of status and their, their development of identity had to do with their ability to distinguish themselves from the people who didn't own land. And of course, we know that that was racialized. And then, of course, with the influx of, of Euro-Americans in into, into Southern California, into um, to Southern California in the 1830s or so, of course, we know that Americans then have to, Euro-Americans have to then assimilate into these populations and these communities. Um, and then when the war happens at the, in the 1840s, right, the U.S.-Mexico War, um, we start to see yet another transition of how land is supposed to be used and another imposition of, of discourses of identity. And so I guess what, I, what I'm getting at here is that with California is one of the interesting things that I saw, um, and this is I think what the historical contribution or the historiographical contribution of my work is, is that rather than thinking about it in a, in a way where I, po uh, I position Californios against Euro-Americans, 
I'm look and, and even against the Spanish in some sense, I'm trying to show how there is a continuity of this imposition of colonialism that is reinterpreted in multiple ways at every given moment. Right, and just because you change the discourse around it doesn't take away the fact that it is co indeed colonialism. And so with the Californios, we see it in their mistreatment of indigenous and mestizos people, right, and within California, uh, within in the area that I'm studying. Um, and so the historical con uh, historiographical contribution is that rather than looking at, at the space and saying, well, this group was against that group, what I found in my research is that there were moments where the Californios tried to assimilate into Euro-American understandings of identity as a way to maintain their own power, right? And, and so the, the I guess the issue with that, of course, is that what, we're, what that is, 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 is their engendering or their production of settler colonialism, right? And, and how they get displaced by Euro-Americans with their own impositions of identity. And one of the things that always stays with me as I talk about this work is that in the archive, looking at, um, I believe it was the Wilson papers, the Benjamin Wilson papers at the Huntington, I remember uh, a calling card. First off, I was like, whoa, this is a calling card. You know, like somebody comes to visit you and they leave you a card, they call on you. So I was like, cool, a calling card. But, and while it doesn't seem significant, while it was while it's significant to me or the reason it's significant to me is that prior to the US Mexico war the cards were in spanish from the same person right i would go visit you i'd leave you a calling card in spanish even though i was a euro american after the war i'm leave the same person is leaving you a card but they're leaving it to you in in english and change the names so you know it's no longer margarita now it's margaret right and so i think that simple calling card stays with me in the sense that it shows how each group is going to displace the other. And ultimately the Californio is displaced by the Euro-American, you know, agricultural, uh, what is it, the gentleman farmer that Laura Bearclaw talks about, right? Uh, and then that gentleman farmer is displaced by the uh, Euro-American railroad capitalist land speculator, right? And so, um, and that's where I end the text, right? But but so I don't know, and, and, and I'd like to hear what you all, what you all think about this. Um, can the discussion of colonization, and I'm not saying this in the sense that colonization is all, all, in, all uh, what is it, um, all encompassing and it takes over and there is no space for resistance. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is how do we, how do we account for the complicity that's involved in colonization? by groups that are supposed to be, that we're supposed to look at and say, oh, wow, they were conquered. Yeah, but they were also conquerors, <laughs> right? So how do we account for that? I guess that's a, I know that's not that part of the question, but <laughs> what do you all think about that? No, I'm popping in right here because that's my book. So, <laughs> you are. Um, and I wanna, I wanna just point out uh, Liliana's comment in the chat where she says, you know, we have to think about the way we do things produce knowledge, the way we write it, filter what does not abide, right? So even thinking about um, most of my book wrestles with those like contentions, right? The shift from Spanish colonization, you know, across the Mexican period to US colonization and how, like you said, Yvette, there were, um, you know, in New Mexico and in Texas, there were individuals who were writing, who were trying to preserve this Spanish lineage by claiming whiteness during the US colonial period by saying, hey, look, we're just like you. Uh, some of that uh, was strategic. Um, some, all of that was that was uh, created different hierarchies that put, um, you know, landless peons, indigenous people, you know, everyone else who, you know, didn't have this sort of like gente de razón, like identity during that time period into a different, you know, it, it, and it wasn't a racial category by that time, right? By that time, the caste system had moved fully into this is a social hierarchy, and this is a um, this is a self-identified social hierarchy, right? So not based on race. Um, people were not willing to identify. For example, Teofas Jaramillo had a grandmother who was Mexican, and she went to Mexico and spoke very um, very poorly. Of uh, you know, just her sort of like the way that she paints Mexico for a literary audience is really demeaning, right? And it's like, your grandma's from there, like cut it out. 
but because she privileges her Spanish heritage or her self-proclaimed Spanish heritage, right? And this is a legacy she wants to pass on to future generations. But, you know, the critiques that I provide in my book is like, we're reading these things today in Chicano literature classes. Um, and that's really problematic, right? So when we're thinking about anything that is sort of pre-Chicano movement, people that, you know, write into whiteness, who claim whiteness, um, part of this um, happens for, you know, various reasons. One is that, for Chicano literary scholars, it's important to recover their literary past, right? So that means looking back into various sources, some that recognize the fact that, you know, our very population were also colonizers at one period of time, right? So when I'm thinking about getting rid of a colonial mindset, like it's complex for Chicano, for Chicanx people because you were a colonizer and you were colonized. So how do you work through the entanglements of those like really contrasting identities while also recognizing that there are various spaces in between those identities, right? So that um, and how do we become, how do we move toward not being complacent or complicit within that structure, right? And how do we decolonize our own colonial mindsets for that very sake, right? How do we write in a way that honors the fact that uh, we took part in that colonial heritage? Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a complicated thing to ask, right? But how do we also be intentional within our classrooms? within our research to also not sort of play into that, right? Because we are in a, we are in a political moment. Um, and this is not a moment where like indigenous sovereignty is being talk, talked about for the very first time, right? We know, you know, Maurice said earlier about when uh, the Spanish and Mestizo like soldiers first arrived to New Mexico, but there was a series of indigenous rebellions all through Northern Mexico in the early 1500s, right? There is like the historical complexity to that is really important as well, right? So that our students, so that, you know, our fellow colleagues don't think like that race is a recent thing, right? Race is not a 1950s construct, race is a 1500s construct. And to historicize that adds, you know, to adds you know, more to our understanding of where we've been and how much more work we still have to do 500 years later. In an hour and a half class. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, any follow-ups? Um, so I, uh, Yvette, you mentioned the, the, the archive and finding the calling card, which to me, um, someone who loves material culture is really cool. Um, I, it brings me to one of the questions we have. And so um, the Open Arizona Project at the Hub was, was about making books open access, freely available online as open access books. And I hope everyone has the opportunity to visit our Open Arizona um, site and, and take a look at the books and also read the, the original essays that each of our panelists wrote um, for, for the project. Um, what we are seeing, of course, we all know that this is that, um, you know, there's this trend in information on the information landscape to go open, like um, toward open access, making uh, archives open access, journals, open access books, data, and I'm really um, interested in sort of how that uh, trend might affect Borderlands uh, scholarship and or or the future of Borderlands studies. Um, so I'm wondering, and I'm keeping my eye on time too, if um, one of you can kick off or, or respond to that. I'm going to call on Vanessa here um, because I know Vanessa, you use one of our um, open access books in one of your classes. So could I ask you to respond to, to that question, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I use, uh, I wrote the introduction for the Reconstructing the Chicano Literary Heritage, um, you know, based on the way that different scholars in the 90s looked at uh, recuperating what might be the longer history of Chicano literature within the US Southwest beginning in the 1500s. And so um, you know, scholars since the 90s for sure have been, you know, contemplating these questions that Yvette posed, right? What is the complicity? What is the complexity in, you know, recovering an early heritage that might uh, further reveal uh, our colonial um, underpinnings or backgrounds? And so um, for the sake of that class, there were two articles that I had um, 
you know, made available through PDF for the students um, because I'm like observing all copyright laws. And, uh, but it was really exciting to know once the semester was over. I mean, in the semester, the students were, I mean, this was for a Conquest Narratives um, graduate course at Arizona State as part of our uh, master's degree in narrative studies. And, you know, the students were wanting to read more about that particular period in history. And I said, hey, there's this great book, right? And it's, you know, it's an older book, so it's probably not $50, but uh, shortly after the semester, uh, y'all had contacted me to ask to um, uh, write the introduction to that. And I thought it was really exciting to think about how all of these sort of seminal essays in terms of recovery projects were being made available widely to folks. And, you know, at no cost to students and no cost to folks who want to, who want to be able to read these works. So I always think about the question of accessibility when we're thinking about open access. And it's sort of a double-edged sword because on one hand, open access is available to anyone with internet access, right? Um, which inherently excludes lots of people, right? We have lots of rural communities. We have, you know, folks who can't afford internet access. Um, and so that's always, you know, the, these sort of challenges and opportunities that come with open access, right? Is that, you know, for me, graduate students and community members can then have resources, right? They don't have to travel to collections. They don't have to travel to libraries or purchase books they, that they might otherwise, um, you know, be able to use for their own sort of research and personal inquiries, right? So the, the, the question of access, again, is a sort of a double-edged sword, but then what are the resources available to libraries and to special collections to be able to digitize? And I think that was a really big question, you know, at the height of COVID is that no one was able to access special collections or the archives for various reasons, right? There were travel restrictions at our universities, we weren't able to go. There were travel restrictions in states and it would vary depending on what states you were in. But there were also not, you know, libraries and special collections are like fantastically understaffed, right? And those, um, it's really, uh, it's interesting to think about like who are the people doing the labor behind those doors, right? And the way, um, you know, the funding that's available to them or not available to be able to digitize those materials at a pace that a researcher or a community member might desire, right? So a lot of people found themselves trying to sort of retool and reconfigure their research projects based on accessibility. Um, to the archives. Um, and then I think uh, certainly from a publishing perspective, um, y'all got a Mellon grant to do this. And so without a Mellon grant, what might have been the possibilities, right? Um, and they would have been a lot more restricted, I think. Um, and you, you know, Kristen, you can confirm that. Uh, but also, um, you know, as someone who is at, you know, an, R, an R1 institution, I'm also thinking about if we begin to publish through open access, um, how does that count? You know, how can we convince the institution that open access is as valid as a peer reviewed top tier journal, right? And so I think, um, you know, not only does open access allow us to publish, to access things, but it also makes it more accessible to the general public so that we don't feel like we're talking to people in a silo if we publish in a top tier journal, there's paywalls, um, there's membership, you know, institutional membership kind of questions. Um, and I just think, you know, there's a lot of, again, you know, opportunities and challenges involved with that. Um, but I'm, I'm really grateful for Open Arizona for having made these books open access because it will, it will enrich, you know, the future teaching of my, uh, the materials that I choose for my courses because I want to be uh, cognizant of the cost um, and whether or not the books I choose to teach in my class are cost prohibitive for my students. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. I know there's a, a, my colleagues in the audience probably love hearing that. So I appreciate that. Um, Maurice, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I was thinking about what Vanessa just said about paywalls and, and one of the great shocks of graduate school was how knowledge is paywalled and how prohibitive that can be to people who don't have means. Um, and so if, if borderlands are about power, like Yvette said, anything that tears down those structures of power and makes knowledge more accessible, I think is a good thing. Um, at the same time, I mean, you're, you're operating a press that needs to you know, balance the books as it were. And, and again, there are questions of as academics, like, where we publish, um, and you know, if, if our books sell copies, or you know, all these the, these are all considerations. Um, but I think the the that that this could tend more towards the democratization of knowledge 
um, is ultimately the, the best result that can happen. Um, and, you know, bringing this back, talking about the borderlands specifically, um, how many you know, borderlands communities or communities of color um, don't, like the potential for people to write from those communities out of those communities, how much of that is stymied by the, the cost? I mean, it's, it, it can be cost prohibitive. I've used my access to um, online databases and things that come through my institutional affiliation for my tribal community numerous times. They've asked me, my uh, tribal culture directors have come to me and said, do you have access to this? We saw a link to something, but we can't get it because it costs so much money. And I'm a click away and I say, yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll whatever I can. And I always tell them like, if there's any resources I can make available to you. And so projects like Open Arizona, I think um, accomplish much of the same. And I think that they're, they're fantastic in that sense. Um, so, so I think that that, yeah, I, I think that as we, as we tend more in that direction, I think it's, it can only be a good thing. Yvette, anything to add? Um, I think I, I think what I concur with what my colleagues have said. I, there are so many, how can I say? I think that the constraints that we have as academics and the whole legitimizing ourselves within the academia, within academia, within the institution kind of puts us in a position where we're like, well, so does that mean you're anti anything that you can't prove how how top tier it is, right? Well, no, I think that, and I agree with what, Mar, what, Mar, what Maurice is saying, right? The idea of let's, do, let, let's make education more accessible. Because I know that what motivated me to become an educator was the ability to change, and this is where it sounds so grandiose, right? But it's like to change the world and change society by providing access to ideas. And if our ideas are under firewalls and paywalls or whatever, then it complicates our ability to reach communities that would be so helped by the by these um sort by these resources. And so I, I think it is. It's it's super important to to make them accessible. We just have to get creative about how we do it. That's I think that's the answer. But that's harder than than it than it looks, I guess. This has been a ter just terrific discussion. Um, we're past time, um, unfortunately, but I do wanna just end. I wanna just, if everyone can stay on just for a few minutes, I know I see people leaving now, um, but uh, just like, if there's any questions, um, please go ahead and, and put it in the chat. And while we um, wait to see if any questions come in, I just wanted to throw kind of a fun question to the panelists about your favorite book. Um, we are a publisher, we love books. And so my question is, is if you could recommend a book that's really emblematic of the Borderlands experience or the Borderlands scholarship, um, what would that book be? And I asked Vanessa if she could recommend to us a work of literature. So real quick, Anyone wants to jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, I thought about this and I was like, what books have I taught in the last? And then I shocked myself. I'm like, in the last 15 years that I've been teaching and I was like, oh Lord, it's been that long. But the one book that stood out the most is Reina Grande's uh, The Distance Between Us. Um, primarily because it does, like, I love, I love the idea of what is the distance between us all, right? What what does it take to have to like come together and have conversation? That's not what the book is about. I just really love the title. But the book is about, you know, her family's crossing um, into the United States. So it is crossing that geopolitical border, but it deals with so many like internal like family dynamics. Um, and the one thing I thought that was really interesting, and I like to challenge my students on this, is that they were mad at the mom for most of the book because the mom decided to have a life like partly unattached to her children. And they were like, you know, dad, regardless of how like problematic he was, he inherited a lot of like violent trauma and he enacted that trauma upon his children, right? And they were like all team dad. And I was like, hold on, like what the patriarchy is like going on here? <laughs> because I wanted them to really think about like, 
what is it like? And again, like I made it personal because I was like, what is it like for mothers to like have to bear the brunt of those societal expectations of like childbirth and child rearing and child raising? And what might it look like for a mom to have her own like identity outside of being a mother and a wife? And so I like to challenge my students. I like to challenge them too. And I use Sandra Cisneros's work, especially like, I don't remember the name of the story, but when like she's in a conversation with this like other woman, right? And so we, we have those conversations and, you know, people are always like down on the women in these. And I was like, that's because like you have a mindset that's like patriarchal, like focused and we need to like break that down. So we try to do that and it's fun. Um, but yeah, so Reina Grande really, the one thing I really love about, you know, the end of her book is that she notes like, this is just my story. Um, and she says, there is nothing like extraordinary about my story. And we all have stories to tell as well, right? So it's a good way to encourage students as well, like to tell their stories, um, whatever in whatever like state of the borderlands they are, like metaphorical, you know, linguistic, ideological, geopolitical. Um, I think it's really important for everyone to know that we that that everyone has a story worth telling. Um, I know which book I'm reading next. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Yvette, how about you? Um, that was a really good one, Vanessa. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think. Um, okay, Kristen, asking bibliophiles what their favorite books are. That's you know. That's a recipe for, for disaster. But I am going to give you just two books, just two, three maybe. And I, I won't explain all of them because they're just self-explanatory. But I'll begin with, the, with, with two books, both that are U of A Press and not because I'm with U of A Press, but because they just have been very impactful in my research. The first one is, is a rather older title, but I do remember reading this in graduate school and it was um, very formative for me in how I conceptualize Borderlands. And it's um, the edited anthology by Donna Guy and Thomas Sheridan, um, 1998, Comparative Frontiers on the Northern and Southern Edges of the Spanish Empire. Um, I love that book because of the fact that it, it, it allowed me to think about borderlands in ways that took me outside of just the US-Mexico geopolitical border and to think about how they function in, in other places in Latin America. So that that was like, requ that's required reading for my, my, in, in my head, right? The other is Miraslava Chavez Garcia's Negotiating Conquest because of the fact that she does traverse these three cycles of conquest, four cycles of conquest that take place in the Southwest. Um, and the most recent one is L. Heidenreich's Nepant La Squared, um, which, which is with uh, Nebraska uh, Press. Um, I, I love that book uh, because of the fact that they are able to really incorporate, as a, Heidenreich's a historian, right? And, and having them incorporate the ideas of borderlands as we are discussing them, but also bringing in the queer element and the trans discourse and the Anzaldulian perceptions of borderlands makes it a very rich text where um, they're able, and part of it is they're just their expertise, right? And their brilliance is their ability to really speak to the multifaceted ways that borderlands exist in our history, but also in our present interactions with, with discourses of power around gender and sexuality. So those are, those are my three, my three uh, books. Great answers. Maurice? Yeah, the, um, I mean, if this is just a, I'm going to uh, take this as a question of something you enjoy that you would recommend. Um, and this is a U of A press book. Uh, it's a Papago Traveler, James McCarthy's biography. Mm -hmm. um, which is a really interesting book if, if we think about, I mean, it's sort of like autobiography. I don't know if it's an as told to, but it, um, edit, it, it's with an editor, but uh, really interesting story if we think about like border crossers as people as, as border crossers and James McCarthy, who is a ton of them, uh, born around 1900, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, he, you know, he has like the Indian boarding school experience and then he's in the military guarding the border during, so like the Pancho Villa days <laughs> as a ton of them in the, in the National Guard, which is did like the, the irony there. Then he's in Bisbee in 1917. Uh, and he's in France during World War One, but then he, he goes to like the Philippines and then to China and he like all of these places. Um, 
So if you think of like an experience in someone's life that epitomizes border crossing, and there's like a humor throughout that I really appreciate that um, he sees the the sort of um, like how ridiculous some of these experiences and some of these places he he finds himself in. Um, but that was, I mean, it's an easy read. It's a short, easy read, but also speaks to um, a lot of the issues we've talked about. But that's uh, the Papago Traveler, the, the memories of James McCarthy, I think. And that's a, a Sun Tracks U of A press book. I think came out in the, maybe the 80s. I mean, he lived to be quite old and did probably like 100 years old or something like that. Um, we, I think, are out of time. Let me just check and see if we have any questions. I do see a question. Um, Chatting on diversity and inclusion, Arizona Governor Ducey signed House Bill 2906 this past Friday on the hot topic, excluding CRT and our public ed system teachings, as well as PD and state-run agency. Any thoughts on the academic and political relationship on CRT going forward? And that's uh, critical race theory. Anyone wanna take? That one. I don't want to take that. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's potentially a, con a whole other conversation for another day. Um, I think that it carries a long history of thinking about, you know, ethnic studies bans more generally speaking in Arizona. And so um, it seems, I mean, yeah, no, no comment. Another day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next conversation. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for those book recommendations. That was fantastic. I love talking about books. Um, Maurice, I haven't read that particular book, so I'm going to um, dig it out of our archives and take a look at that. That's really great. To, um, that one that one wasn't on my radar so much, so I really love hearing about that one. Um, I just wanted to really say thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for your time today, um, sharing your insights, your, your knowledge, your expertise, your wisdom. And I say that in the truest sense, um, this has really been, been fabulous. And for me, a real honor to share the stage with you. Um, for real, I'm just really thankful. And um, I will like to say that our event, our event could not have been, um, could not have happened without my colleagues at the University of Arizona Press in our University of Arizona Libraries. Um, the Open Arizona Project would not have been possible without the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, thanks again to our panelists, Maurice, Vanessa, and Yvette. And thanks to all of you who joined us this lovely, now sunny afternoon in Southern Arizona or wherever you are in Zoom land. Um, we are grateful. Thank you.